So in today's session, we're going to talk a little bit more about the durability of natural immunity. Many of you have asked a lot of questions about this. I think it's in the media because the CDC recently put out a report. It was on the 29th of October suggesting that immunizations offer a five-fold greater protection compared to rates of reinfection in those who are unvaccinated yet have prior immunity. Now, we're going to talk about some of the data. I'm not going to address that study in any more depth henceforth because the thought police really don't like you to question our institutions. However, the findings from that internal report from the CDC do not corroborate with the large body of evidence that has been published from different countries throughout the world, even our own uh, Cleveland Clinic and UCLA, okay? So that's as far as that conversation is going to go because unfortunately, in this era, in 2021, you have to worry about the thought police. You have to worry that your videos and your channel and your platforms could be deleted, censored, which is a shame because we hear so much that we should follow the science. And so what I'm going to do in today's video we're going to follow the science. We're going to look at the rates of reinfection. And let me just give you the 50,000 foot view. Rates of reinfection are less than 1%. According to data from Israel, according to data from Cleveland Clinic, if you want to believe Cleveland Clinic, which I have no reason to not believe, and UCLA. And a systematic review of over 10 studies, again, find that rates of reinfection are exceedingly low. So when our own institution puts out a paper saying that rates of reinfection in their internal report is 9%, and the rest of the world says it's less than 1%, it makes you scratch your head a little bit. So that's as far as I'm going to go about that particular report. That said, it inspired me to retest my own antibodies. And I want to share with you about that. And it's not just my own N of 1. Maybe this is my own bias. Because for those of you that have listened to our, our information, I want to thank you for being here, by the way. Back in December of 2020, I got infected with SARS-CoV-2 as have over 100 million other Americans, according to scientific experts. And so I'm curious, right? Like, hey, what is the durability of natural immunity? Because I've been, I love labs, as many of you know. We're going to talk about lab work and interpreting labs in just a moment. But I've been serially testing my SARS-CoV-2 spike protein antibodies using two different kits from LabCorp. A lot of you asked the questions about this. I will put links below to the exact tests that I recommended, including the UPC codes, so that you yourself can go do this. You do need a physician to write this for you. Now, I think it's important to look at two different kits to the spike protein for purposes of redundancy. The specificity is like 99.8. So these are really specific and sensitive. And my antibody decay is really marginal at best. In July, it was 320 units per per liter or ml. And now it's 291, okay? What's interesting though, is I really think that I was re-exposed sometime during June even though I didn't get sick, because so many people were circling with the Delta. A lot of people that I knew tested positive around me, and I never got sick. So again, when the CDC put out that report suggesting that rates of reinfection are north of 9%, it made me scratch my head. I think it was 8.7%, actually. Um, I was like, that seems quite high, especially what we know from other countries throughout the world. So this is, I think I've spent now $1,300 in testing. I'm just really interested in this, just naturally curious, um, just running labs, looking at this. I've also, uh, for those of you that, that don't know, you can look at your T-cell immunity through t-detect.com. That's a different assay, but essentially how immune memory works before we dive into the systematic reviews and the durability of natural immunity. Essentially, when you're exposed to a pathogen, what happens first is your innate immune system is is first on on patrol, right? That's what's going to not have much memory, but it's going to hopefully take care of the job and and so forth. And, and then over time, then your T cells will recognize the intruder, whether it's a bacteria or virus, and say, okay, we need to remember what this looks like. And so you have your memory T cells will sort of take some of those amino acids that determine the antigenicity of the virus, and they'll start to make memories of that And those memories are translated from the T cells to your B cells and your plasma cells, and your B cells will start to make antibodies. Now, the antibodies will naturally decay over time because, of course, if you're not re-exposed to the pathogen, your body's like expending energy, keeping these antibodies high. But if there's no need to keep them high because you're not re-exposed, they will go down. But upon re-exposure to a pathogen, the same pathogen, those plasma cells can be upregulated on demand. And they probably don't go away. They probably last for a lifetime. In fact, this was data in May of this year where even our own institutions were were acknowledging these plasma cells, which are part of the B cells. These are the manufacturing sort of machines, uh, the houses, the the manufacturing plants of antibodies, okay? 
I think I've told you before, you know, the NPR article that found that elderly subjects that were exposed to the 1918 Spanish flu still have antibodies 90 plus years later. I mean, this is insane. So the fact that that was being promoted as science and, oh my gosh, isn't the human immune system so amazing? That article was a few years ago, by the way. Now, like scientists in the expert consensus, at least here in the US, again, the land of the free, the free world, we are very skeptical about natural immunity, even though the data is quite clear. Rates of reinfection for people who have already been exposed is less than 1%, yet we're still skeptical of this. Let's get into the lab testing. And first, I just want to welcome you back. It's Mike Mutzel. Thank you for being here as always. Thank you for hitting that like button. Thank you for subscribing. And thanks for sharing this with a friend or family member who you think might enjoy this video. That really helps us. Also, we have an upcoming e-course, two live webinar trainings. Uh, this is a paid e-course, but we're going to talk about blood work interpretation. As many of you know, we've talked a lot about liver enzymes, the, the impetus and the purpose of donating blood. We talked about hormone testing, testosterone, looking at DHEA. We've been talking about liver function tests and metabolic health. So we have a blood work live masterclass. So we're going to meet on the 16th of November and the 30th of November. And there's additional videos and PDFs in there. The cost of that is $67. We're going to spend a lot of time together and we're going to have a lot of fun on these two webinars and we're going to have Q&A after so we can, we can hang out for 90 minutes, two hours. The point here is to help you understand your labs. At the end of the year, is it's a great time to review your blood work. So if you want to sign up for that e-course and that live training, okay, it's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. I know you're going to enjoy it. There will be links below there, okay, friends? Okay, the different kits that I recommend for looking at your uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibodies to the spike protein are, are featured here. This is the UPC code. You need a physician to order this. I recommend the redundancy and also looking at the nucleocapsid. Now, Here's what's interesting is if you've been vaccinated and you think you've been prior exposed to SARS-CoV-2, it doesn't serve you a lot of good to look at the spike protein because that should be elevated if you've been vaccinated. However, you could look at the nucleocapsid. Now, that is not part of the immunization. So if that is increased, there's a good chance that you had had some sort of exposure either since immunization or before. So that could be interesting for some of you. Um, the way to look at your T-cells is t-detect.com. Now, here's a great article that I think you should share is vaccinating people who had had COVID-19. Why doesn't natural immunity count in the U.S.? Remember, the land of the free, the home of the brave, but we deny the presence of prior infection, which is crazy. I, wh how can we be so pro-science, yet we are not acknowledging the fact that natural immunity means something, that people who have already had a course of infection are exceedingly unlikely to be reinfected. Rates are less than 1%. The journalist says the US CDC estimates that SARS-CoV-2 has infected more than 100 million Americans, and evidence is mounting that natural immunity is at least as protective as vaccination. Again, the thought police on YouTube, I'm reading verbatim what they're saying from the British Medical Journal, okay? So just please don't penalize me for saying that. Yet uh, public health leadership says everyone needs the vaccine. What about other countries that don't have the resources? Virologists and researchers Florian Kramer argued for one dose in those who have recovered. So uh, this would spare individuals from unnecessary pain getting the second dose, and it would free up additional vaccines, he told the New York Times. You know, so there was that study in the um, Journal of Internal Medicine that found that upon the second dose of individuals who had had a prior course of immunity, they're more likely to experience the COVID-like illness all over again, right? So there's a much higher uh, probability of uncomfortableness. And, and why make people go through that if they already have proof of prior infection, which is interesting. Here's a quote from Marty Macri, a professor of health policy and management at Johns Hopkins University. Many of us were saying, let's use the vaccine to save lives, not to vaccinate people already immune. That is something interesting to talk about. Now, data from Israel, and we've covered this data, again, large cohorts of individuals involving over 600,000 subjects found that rates of reinfection uh, are exceedingly low. In fact, in their new cases, individuals who had prior, uh, documented prior infection, uh, they only comprise 1% of new cases, whereas individuals who had been fully immunized represent 40% of new cases. Now, that's not to say that vaccines don't work. That's not to say that vaccines don't save lives. That is simply to say that natural immunity is pretty durable, uh, okay? Now, one of the largest uh, studies published to date was published in Science in February of 2020, and that found that although antibodies declined over eight months, as ex is expected, right, you don't need super high levels of antibodies if you're not being constantly re-exposed, 
Memory B cells increased over time, and the half-life of memory CD8 and CD4 T cells suggested a steady presence. So these cells didn't totally decline over time. Now, here's some research from the Cleveland Clinic involving 52,000 individuals. This was prior to the vaccine mandate, so they had a large percentage of individuals who had been infected but unvaccinated. They had people who had been not infected but had been vaccinated. And what they found is there was no difference in the incidence of infection over the duration of the study. There was yet another study in UCLA. And I can't remember, I think this was 6,000 combined subjects. They found that not one of the 1,300 previously infected but unvaccinated subjects had an infection during the duration of that study. And the scientists want to say, in both of these different studies, the conclusions are quite similar. Previous SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination for SARS-CoV-2 were associated with a decreased risk for infection or reinfection of SARS-CoV-2 in a routinely screened workforce. Again, these are individuals that are working for Cleveland Clinic or UCLA and all that. Uh, there was no difference in the infection incidence between immunized individuals and individuals with a pre prior infection. But again, why are we talking about this? Because just last week, the CDC made it sound as though there's a massive difference. And the, the that doesn't corroborate with all of this research. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying we should just disregard everything the CDC says. I'm not saying that. No, I'm saying that, okay, one piece of data, especially when it's an internal report, we should be looking at how that corroborates and how that sort of coincides with the existing body of data from our, you know within the US and also uh, outside of the US. There was another systematic review. This involved 10 studies that were eligible for this. And the conclusion here is very similar to the conclusion we just read. The protective effect of a prior SARS-CoV-2 infection on reinfection is quite high and similar to the protective effect of immunization. So more research is needed to characterize the duration of protection and the impact on different SARS-CoV-2 variants. And that title there is a systematic review of the protective effect of prior SARS-CoV-2 infection on repeat infection. So again, I'm not suggesting you know, that you go out and lick the toilet seats in the ICU. All I'm suggesting here is maybe we go back to the drawing board and we know that there's a lot of third world countries with elderly people, high risk people who are unvaccinated. Why don't we allocate some of those immunizations to those people who would really benefit from at least one or two doses, right? And we have hundreds, probably 120 million at this point in the US, according to various epidemiologists that have had a prior infection, right? We, we have proof of that with antibodies, positive tests, whatever. You know, why are we making those people, uh, you know, go through the go through the pain again of reliving, you know, the sort of the, the challenges that were associated with their first infection, right? The headaches, the fatigue, the malaise, uh, and all of that. When we know the chances of them, the probability, according to the dossier of emerging science, of them getting reinfected is quite low, friends. That's all I'm saying here. Uh, hopefully, the thought police will not censor me for posting this video. Again, we're all about following the data. Look at the science. Here's the science, friends. Rates of reinfection in a previously infected individual is quite low, as we just talked about. So, thought police, please consider that before censoring or <laughs> deleting this video. Uh, this is not to cast doubt on the protectiveness of the immunizations, especially for high risk, the elderly. We know that risk of death and risk of severe disease uh, is quite low in people who are fully vaccinated, right? So as always, I'm grateful that you tuned all the way to the end. Thank you for hitting that like button. Thank you for sharing this video if it resonated with you. And consider the blood work masterclass if you want to take a deep dive into your labs and check out those UPC codes if you want to run your nucleocapsid antibodies or antibodies to the spike protein if you think you've been exposed to this pathogen and the t-cell immunity assay is t-detect.com okay friends we will catch you on a future episode down the road as always thank you for being here bye now yeah.